Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to all of our friends who are with us um, from near and far. And uh, welcome to Out in the Diaspora. This is the first of what we hope will be an annual celebration of Pride Month and LGBTQIA authors, artists, and creators in the Iranian diaspora. Today's program is made possible through a collaboration between the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies and Diaspora Arts Connection. And I want to give a special shout out to my friend and colleague, Nazi Kavyani, whose idea it was to, um, to mark this month with a celebration of the many creative and thoughtful people in our own community. And we know that this is um, a rather unusual event because of um, a lot of longstanding homophobia, transphobia in our community. And we wanna break the mold and really um, give a shout out to all of you who are um, LGBTQIA and also to the many artists who make our community a richer place. Um, and I wanna also make a special uh, shout out to Diaspora Arts Connection, which is an organization that Nazi directs. They do a lot of wonderful work and like many organizations, nonprofit organizations in the age of COVID-19 are struggling. So if you can um, go to their website, look at their wonderful evening programs. They have Diaspora Arts Connection at home and you can make a donation to support them. Uh, to keep them going in this very lean time. It's uh, www.diasporaartsconnection.org slash backslash donate. Um, I also want to encourage you to check out our programming, including next week on Thursday, the 25th. We're going to have an event with a dance performance with um, a collaboration between Shirin Rahimi and, uh, sorry, Hushidar Murtazai. Um, you can find out more on our Facebook page and also on um, our website, which is uh, Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies. Additionally, I want to make sure that you know that all the artists who are with us today either have websites or you can Google them to find their publications or artwork. So please follow them. They're doing wonderful work. Um, before I introduce the writers who are going to participate in today's event um, and you know tell you a little bit about them, I wanted to um, share with you this really wonderful news that we got on Monday. We got a proclamation um, through the city and county of San Francisco signed and uh, forward to, forwarded to us from Supervisor Asha Safai from District 11 of San Francisco. And I'm going to read it to you because it's a big deal for us to get this proclamation. And I want you to know that this belongs to all of you and all of our community. And um, it's an important recognition of Pride Month and the spe specificity of our Iranian diaspora community. Whereas San Francisco and the County of San Francisco have been a welcoming and enriching place for LGBTQIA, people of all races, creeds, nationalities, and walks of life to feel free of oppression and to explore their culture, identity, and history. And whereas Iranians in the diaspora have struggled to be free of homophobia, gender, and sexual discrimination, and in some cases have sought asylum in the United States and other countries around the world under fear of persecution in their home country. And whereas the richness of the Bay Area and San Francisco have been a welcoming and loving community for members of the LGBTQIA community of Iranian heritage and the Iranian diaspora. And whereas the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies at San Francisco State recognizes the importance of shining a light on the diverse people of Iran and its diaspora and recognizes its unique relationship to the city of San Francisco as a place that holds social justice as a value in its work both on and off the San Francisco State campus. And whereas the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies is hosting the first ever out in the diaspora virtual cultural events during the month of June 2020, the first event being today and the next one being on the 25th, um, to honor those whose lives and contributions enrich our communities and the arts and culture of everyone in the San Francisco Bay Area and beyond. Now, therefore, be it resolved, proclaimed that the city of San Francisco declares the month of June 2020 as out in the Iranian diaspora month and celebrates the contributions of this unique community 
and acknowledges those who came before and risked their lives to be free and out so that subsequent generations in Iran and elsewhere could identify themselves as LGBTQIA without fear of violence, state repression, or gender and sexual discrimination. And it's signed by Asha Safari. So I just wanted to share that with you because it's really important that we have public support from our elected officials and also to say that um, we see you and celebrate you and this is our way of um, acknowledging the, the contributions that you all have made. Um, I wanted to just also let all of you who are with us know that we are going to have a, a opportunity for some questions at the end. You will need to write your questions or comments and I will narrate them to specific um, authors here. If you want to direct it to everybody, you should say that. We're not going to have it be a free form because we want to avoid any sort of uh, traffic jams or um, we sometimes know that people write offensive things. So I'll be sort of moderating that portion of it. Um, and you should also feel free to sign up for our newsletter to follow us on social media because we hope to be involved with you in future collaboration. And finally, um, please do uh, come to next week's event on Thursday at five. The video that we're going to be showing you is of Mokhtar doing a storytelling Nakali performance and talking a little bit about his artwork. Um, that will be made available in full after the program. So you'll only see a, a segment of it, but we hope that you'll get to watch it and um, feel free to communicate with Mokhtar on his website about um, any comments you want to relay to him. Um, and I think that's it for the housekeeping. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce the first author, um, which is Nina Mir. Um, they are a student at San Francisco State University. We're so lucky to have you, Nina, with us. Um, we miss being in contact with you in person. Um, Nina is a computer science student, I believe, and they like to read short stories and occasionally write. They left Iran more than a decade ago and have been coming out ever since. Nina, you have the stage. Hi, uh, I hope I am, yes, okay, yes. Hello. So I would like to read for you a little bit of this short story I have been working on for more than a year and I hope to end it. So it's called Penguin. And before I start reading, I would like to just give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So there is this human person who was born in Iran and then they moved to the United States. And then they went through a lot of transitioning, transitions and eventually they tr transitioned to a penguin. And now they are like this established college professor in Oakland and they have a dog. And then they hear after decades out of Iran, they hear from their sister that their mom has three to six months left to live. And they decide that they're going to Iran. They decide they, they're going to visit their dying mother. So the first problem is that because they have no valid Iranian passport. And it's uh, kind of hard to visit Iran without a passport or a visa, unless obviously you are a New York Times columnist or a, I don't know, anti-capitalist black Muslim. Iranian government would give you a visa easily. Otherwise, it's very hard. So the first step is to go to this little office in the heart of a Georgetown neighborhood in DC where it is called Daftar. And Daftar is this building that Iranian officials can offer some consulate services. So I'm just gonna start reading from going to Daftar, this building. Past the Pakistani guard atop two worn out flights of stairs sat the cavernous space reminiscent of any permanent makeshift garage, a storage mosque a space of any boys high school I ever saw as a teenager in Tehran. This sort of multi-purpose space could accommodate up to 200 teenagers tightly arranged in close 
rows immersed in their own peculiar scent of smelly socks and teenage angst, preying on used dirty carpets, or conversely, a hundred boys sitting on chairs taking TOEFL in the hopes of permanently leaving Iran to take shelter among the whiter white people and never look back, or so they, I thought. All the white walls were in some purplish hue because of the peculiar brand of fluorescent tubes lighting the space. A softly audible clunky white Toshiba TV at one corner greeted all the visitors to Daftar, it seemed. Was that a Russian tradition, Chinese or Persian? Was that also a spy cam? Even if I knew the answers to all these questions, nothing changed how awkward I felt in that space. The space was already doing its magic. I began to walk more like a sad soldier on the way to the barrack commander's office to get disciplined for losing the flag. My head leaning forward, trying to see the tips of my shoes while I was a slouching forward, trying to hide my red wings even more than when I first noticed my then newly emerging pomegranate wings. I was not having fun, AKA suffocating, thinking about all the ways this space was affecting me when my mindfulness coping training kicked in. So I began to concentrate on the bulkiest thing I could cling on to beside the walls, the TV again. I remembered when my rich aunt changed their TV to an assembled in Iran, German brand white flat screen in the early aughts. We felt pressure to change our ancient relic of Panasonic's Reina as the color of king, uh, as the king of color TVs in the 80s, but my parents never did so until a decade later when such technology was cheaper. My aunt's new TV was the shining center of their living room. Everyone sitting in deep sea chairs chilling around their TV. It was undoubtedly a cherry central figure of any Iranian home growing up. My standout TV related teenage memory was going to the house of a religious conservative friend of my dad, who was also an Iran Iraq war veteran on the occasion of his return from pilgrimage to Mecca. The center of the men's sitting section was a fancy Sony flat screen TV. It was a perfect medium to screen a censored version of Dances with the Wolves in HD. Besides staring at all the unkempt beards surrounding me, I wondered if the women's section also had a fancy TV or not. For my sister, there was a TV, but no Kevin Costner playing the quintessential good white American man on the screen. Inside Daftar, instead of Kevin, a hijabi green-eyed female news anchor of some Iran government satellite channel was informing the many, many empty chairs and the few people who were not chairs. There were chairs lining up any exposed wall in addition to four rows of 10 chairs facing the rectangular glass wall separating Daftar employees from the rest. Why Daftar really needed more than a hundred chairs was definitely beyond my pay grade or long-term interest, but analytical thinking had always restored some self sense of self-worth, especially when I was most dysphoric. In this case, I was simply out of my element, but I knew deep in my heart that I would eventually get what I wanted. I was never an opposition political activist. Well, there were a few occasions that I openly mocked a few ir religious Iranian friends of mine, but in general, I was a nobody, which was why I knew I would be able to get an Iran passport. But my mind was racing around asking all kinds of useless questions, such as how many penguins ever visited Daftar, which church they chose to sit at, were they alone or accompanied with family? But my therapist mindfulness therapy again, was triggered immediately. All I had to do was to remind myself nothing in this office, in this space, in this city was my business. I was nothing of consequence, a shadowless pebble of no sound, impact or record. Knowing more about that space, that office, its employees would never better me or get me to Tehran faster. To get to Tehran faster, 
I had to get a number and wait in line and look the way they wanted me to look. So I approached the please take a number sign. My number was nine while the number on the overhead digital board was one. Everything in computer science starts with zero element and it was said Muslims invented zero. Chinese? Well, who was the zero? Another question I should not have thought of. However, I remembered I had a 2006 O. Henry Prize collection book on me. Excitedly, I began to read. This story was about a son visiting his dying dad in the hinterlands of New Mexico after many, many years while tagging along his bride. I was enamored with the way the author made the long gone sons visiting his dad into a very engaging artsy telling of how an utter dry waste of time it turned out to be. Maybe one day I could make the O. Henry Prize cut if I kept writing and learned the names of the trees, colors, clouds, birds, textile and clothing items, in addition to carpentry tools, philosophical jargon, and esoteric grammatical points in American English. Maybe even doing an MFA in creative writing somewhere in Georgia or Tennessee, where people were proud of their farmer stands and immensely empty skylines would help too. Or maybe I could try to be less of a bitter fuck to my therapist pride while evading my turn in daftar. To that more realistic goal, I kept on reading this story. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, next we have uh, Dena Rod. Dena is a creative nonfiction editor at Homology Lit and runs the Radar Productions blog. They are their nonfiction essays and poetry illuminate the diasporic experience of Iranian Americans and queer identity. And they are going to be reading from My Shadow is My Skin, which is a, a newly published anthology of essays by Iranian diaspora writers. And I hope you all get this book. It's wonderful. So Dana, take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Dana Rod, and I'm happy to join you today to read from My Shadow is My Skin, um, published by the University of Texas Press. I highly encourage you to get yourself a copy. I'll be reading an excerpt from my essay, um, Pushing the Boundaries. Coming out is not a singular process, ever. You can never do it just once because everyone assumes you to be straight. Coming out to my parents in 2009 was only the beginning. Since then, I have constantly come out about my queerness to strangers on the street, cashiers taking my coffee order when I'm holding my wife's hand, or before I was married when I first met people and they assumed the fiance I spoke of was male. Now it's always an act of coming out when I say my wife, and there's no misunderstanding anymore about the differences between girlfriend and fiance. This protracted coming out also translates to my extended Iranian family. I remember constantly checking in with my parents about which aunts and uncles I could be honest with. They're not actually related to me by blood, but knit into our family by distance and circumstance. And when I first introduced Diana to my parents, it felt like coming out all over again. My palms were so sweaty, I couldn't even hold her hand. We were at a barbecue held at my childhood home where my dad was grilling juja kebab. There weren't very many of my Iranian aunts and uncles there, mostly white work friends of my father's, and yet, even so, I felt like I couldn't be affectionate with Diana in front of them. I recall looking longingly at the other party goers who could show affection to their significant others. And these days, after I've been with her for nearly a decade, I don't hesitate anymore to reach for her hand in front of my parents. But I do sometimes think about what the social and political consequences would be if I were to reach for her hand walking down the streets of Tehran. Does Amu Mehdi know, I asked my father once, about our extended family? Does Arya? Does Khosrow? Persians like to talk. Even though I didn't speak with my extended family often and knew that they were too polite to say anything to my face, 
they're more more likely than not to already know the family gossip and to have said something to my parents. They were more proficient in their Farsi than I was, and with my American accent being the family joke, I spoke Farsi like a Turk, my dad said, every time I tried to say sofra ak, the wedding altar set up in front of a bride and groom with the hard g sound not found in English. And my communication with my extended family had all but ceased because of my discomfort with the language and lack of understanding of what my family was saying around me. Amumedi knows, Khosro knows, Arya knows. My dad rattled off a list of my entire extended family in Northern California. And a prickly, hot, cold feeling came over me. The only person I'd taken time directly to tell about my queerness was Uncle Rasul, who embraced me with open arms and understood completely. The reality that my entire family knew about me and Diana without my consent felt terrifying. But surely nothing was amiss since my dad said all of this so nonchalantly. It's a different country, a different culture, he said. We have to adapt. This sentiment made me want to protest. I would have been just as queer growing up in Iran, albeit much more closeted. My queerness wasn't an American influence. It was part of me that would have been the same in Tehran or San Francisco. Yet my father's words sowed seeds of doubt. Adaptation can also feel like assimilation, especially when it comes to growing up in America. At times, it feels like my relationship with my wife is proof of how far I've strayed. Here I am, married to a white woman from Texas whose heritage is as middle America as you can possibly get. Would I have these same feelings that was born and raised in Iran? Would my queerness have spurred me to leave the country as my parents' political beliefs had them? Tracing these threads sometimes seemed as if it could unravel my sense of being Iranian, especially when my dad would reassure me that I was a child of America, not Iran. And the anxiety I'd felt about coming out to my parents was nothing compared to how I felt about telling them that I was gonna marry a woman. But after five years of getting to know Diana, my parents supported me, loved me, congratulated me. The chasm regarding my sexuality felt smaller than it had in years. And as I debuted my engagement ring on Christmas, seven months after we had actually gotten engaged, my dad asked me why. So scared. All right, congratulations, he said. He smiled, crinkling his eyes in a way that I couldn't read. And of course, the consequences of being openly queer in Iran are dire as homosexuality is considered punishable by death. I've never been to Iran, but I feel an intense need to go despite my misgivings. Yet with every word I write, that possibility grows slimmer and slimmer. My parents have always discouraged me from going to Iran, telling me to go anywhere else on earth. Go to Dubai, go to India, even go to the Emirates. Just don't go to Iran, my dad always says. The sentiment is understandable as they can't accompany me if I go, so they'd be helpless to assist me if anything untoward were to happen. Yet I can't deny my desire to see Shiraz, the town my father grew up in, and Abadan, where my mother grew up. I need to see the ruins of Persepolis and Denal, the highest peak of the Zagros mountain range, which I am named after. But how am I supposed to travel to the villages where my parents grew up, a country I've never been to, and not bring my wife? How could we take such a life-affirming journey together and not display any affection towards one another? Homosexuality is an open secret in Iranian society, told in whispers rather than in marched parades. Among Iranians, those of us who come out despite our family's wishes for a glass closeted existence are seen as rocking the boat, advised not to tell anyone outside a small circle. My uncle Russell always encouraged me to speak openly about Diana to the rest of my extended family. He was the only one who insisted on meeting her when he came back to California to visit from North Carolina. You need to be public about this, he advised. We're in America. 
there should be no more living in shame. But will my decision to live a more authentic life prevent me from seeing Iran? I don't know whether my extended family living there knows about my queerness. How could I ask them to sponsor a visa for myself and my wife, knowing it might put them in danger with the Iranian government? How could I possibly see the country with a state mandated tour guide watching our every move? And would a, having a white woman accompanying me prevent access to spaces that I otherwise would be able to enter? Thank you. My name is Zenara. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dena. That was beautiful. Um, next, we have um, Danny Rafinajad um, or Daniel. Danny Rafinajad taught Persian language and literature at Harvard University before devoting himself to full time writing and translating. His work has appeared in Pearls of Persia, the Philosophical Poetry of Nasir, Nasir Hosro and My Shadow is My Skin, from which Dana also just read, uh, Voices from the Iranian Diaspora. He's working on a collection of essays uh, and a memoir and recently completed his first play. So welcome, Danny. Thank you, thank you so much, Persis. Thank you for having me. Um, I am indeed reading from My Shadow is My Skin. Um, I just wanted to say briefly, this is an unusual essay in that it didn't intend to be one. It started as, an email correspondence between a former student and myself. And what I will read to you is, is more or less unchanged. I changed names, of course, and identifying features, and some parts that wouldn't have made sense to um, uh, an outside reader. But it's pretty much what I wrote in a sort of fever. A student asked me for advice, and I wrote 13 pages <laughs> in response. Uh, so this is my advice column. Um, I also wanted to say briefly that I do um, deal with some adult topics um, that might be triggering, like sexual violence. So if that disturbs you or bothers you, please know that's coming, and, or this is not for a family audience at all. And it also will um, offend Republicans, which I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> it's called Two Minutes to Midnight. April 1st, 2018. Hi, Danny. Hope this email finds you well. This is so incredibly random, but I was a student of yours 10 years ago at the summer intensive Persian class at UCLA. I hope you remember me. I was the half Iranian, half Filipino kid. You were an amazing teacher, and I could really speak Farsi after that summer. Now, all these years later, I'd like to continue with lessons. I'd love to be able to speak to my dad's family in Iran. Would you be able to recommend anyone in LA? I have another question, also totally random, and I hope you don't mind me asking. On the last day of class, when you were saying your goodbyes, you mentioned that it had been a difficult summer for you and that you had been struggling. I remember you said you were on antidepressants. I've been struggling a lot this year too. It sounds so stupid, but I feel like it has all has to do with the election. What's happening in this country is making me so stressed out and depressed, but I'm addicted to the news and to social media. I feel hopeless, like nothing's going to change, but I can't stop myself from reading everything about Donald Trump. I'm finding I'm drinking more than usual and that the smallest thing will set off my rage. How are you dealing with this last crazy year? Do you think antidepressants would help me? You seemed so wise and so together that summer, even though you were going through a hard time. I thought I'd ask for your advice. If you don't have the time or you don't want to answer, no worries at all. Thanks so much. Linus in Los Angeles. April 3rd, 2018. Dear Linus, of course I remember you. Thank you for your kind words. Let me start by saying that you are feeling hurt and angry because you're a compassionate, thoughtful person, the opposite of stupid. I'm sorry you're having a rough time. I could give you anodyne advice like limit social media engagement to 15 minutes a day or join more marches and protests, or immerse yourself in Persian. But I don't think that's what you're asking me for. Whatever I said in that classroom 10 years ago struck you as honest and maybe a little courageous. So I'm going to try to reply with honesty and courage. I apologize in advance if any of this comes across as condescending. Without worksheets and vocab quizzes, I don't have the authority I have in the classroom. 
Right now, at this moment in the time of Trump, April 2018, my mother and father are 72 and 74, and they live in Northern California. They are generous, jovial, weird, fucked up people. I love them, and not just out of filial duty. I respect my mother for her artist's eye and for the poetic way she speaks. I respect my father for his industry and for his sense of adventure. They are as blind to race as any two people I've ever met. I'm in awe of how, as immigrants in this country, they've succeeded, even flourished, during very uneasy times. For years, however, I hated them. I hated them because they didn't protect me, and I hated them because they were too scared and too weak to accept me. An adult man, not in my family, sexually molested me from the time I was nine until I was about six, until about six months after I turned 13. He was in his 50s, and he smelled of pepper, Colton aftershave, and carefree sugarless bubble gum. He made me jerk him off, he made me suck him off, he penetrated me with objects and with his body. If I resisted, and I seldom did, he would humiliate and strike me. Like most victims of abuse, I told no one about it, but I changed dramatically. You can see it in my school pictures. First grade, second grade, a tousled but happy kid, not so different from any other, a precocious glint in the eyes. Third, fourth, and fifth grades, I don't just look sad or hollow, Linus, I look deformed. My face and my body are twisted in aged criminal anguish. How could my parents not see that? How could they not see my sudden change in habits, that I stopped bathing, that I stopped eating, that I threw myself off the roof of my father's Jeep to break my arm for a second time? Wasn't it their job to see these things, to make the right conclusions, to protect me? I didn't tell them about it until I was 18, and they didn't believe me. We didn't speak about it again until I was 36, and then they did believe me. The summer I turned 21, I told my parents I was gay. My mother promptly called me an animal, told me I would die of AIDS, and wrote me in a birthday card that as a gift to her, I should promise I wouldn't open my heart to a man for many, many years. In a very air-conditioned Starbucks in Mountain View, California, that same summer, my father informed me that I had two options, enter into a sexless marriage with a woman or live with him and my mother until they died, and or take up bowling. He actually offered bowling as an alternative to loving another human being, Linus. Because of their otherwise open-minded Berkeley in the 60s attitudes, I was surprised by their homophobia, but it was just that fear. There were no openly gay people in the Iranian community of the Bay Area then. And my parents didn't socialize with non-Iranians. The only gay person my mother knew was her hairdresser who died of AIDS. Parents want to see themselves reflected in their children. And when mine didn't see themselves, they pinned their biggest fears, disease and death for my mother, ostracism for my father, on something that seemed as natural to me as my smile. So I didn't listen to them. I fell in love with a man, a fellow grad student at UCLA. Four years later, he developed pancreatic cancer and succumbed to it very shortly thereafter. I was 29, he was 36. My parents never met him. I didn't even know he existed until he got sick when we needed money for his treatment. A month before he died, my parents visited me. As my mother and I pulled up to the little pink house my boyfriend and I shared, I told her how excited he was to meet her. She refused to get out of the car. I can't, she said. I can't go in. She waited in the parked car while I went into the house and did whatever I needed to do, which was probably what most caretakers do, just sit quietly. I then drove her back to her hotel. Now, why am I telling you these sad personal stories? What do they have to do with the president? And why is my page not turning for some reason? Ah, here we go. We see our president as a parent and our country as a family. This is our homeland founded by fathers we're supposed to respect and love. Such thinking isn't unique to the United States, of course, but we're additionally taught that we live in the greatest, richest, most powerful country on earth, 
headed by the leader of the free world, and that is unique. Like our parents, our presidents can seem the most familiar and the most elusive figures in our lives. Our mothers and fathers, whether or not they're any good at it, guide us through childhood, life's most vulnerable time, when we aren't capable of seeing them as anything less than godheads. We comprehend neither their intentions nor their reactions. As our parents do when we're children, the president seems everywhere, in our living rooms, on our computers, at our kitchen tables, and we're never quite sure how much power he has or how far he'll go with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. That was wonderful. And thank you for sharing us, sharing with us some very difficult things. Uh, I appreciate it so much. And lastly, we have um, Mohtar Paki, who's a visual artist, art teacher, and architectural designer. His work has been exhibited throughout the San Francisco Bay Area and in his Berkeley studio. He's written several short stories and articles in Iranian anthologies, and his novel, Shamayele Mana, was published in Sweden in 1997 and in Iran in 2003. His second novel, Sherazad of Silence, was published in 2015. And you can learn more about his projects on mohtarpaki.com. So take it away, Mohtar. He's going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to show his video. So Mokhtar, maybe you could introduce this project of, that we're gonna see. Talk a little bit about the evolution of it and maybe um, what segment you've selected to share with us and mm -hmm. just a, a brief introduction to the whole video and yeah. maybe a little bit about your own artistic process. Yeah. Okay, um, this is a short film. Uh, well, it's not that short. It's about a 25 minutes film uh, based on uh, my uh, study about the Iranian mythology and also about Pardekhani and Napoli in Iran. And uh, the fact that uh, since I was a child, I was interested in uh, Iranian mythology and especially uh, Shahnameh of Ferdowsi and the characters that there are not many, many people are not interested in like uh, uh, thieves or some sort of monsters uh, or we can call it demons. And um, and, and the fact that I related to do this, these characters because they were very outsiders. And uh, most of the story that I am um, interested and in, actually I explained and narrated is about my childhood and um, the influence of my uh, mother and my uh, cousin who used to narrate and uh, recite Shahnameh of Ferdos every night for everybody, uh, all the family members. And um, my emphasis mostly is about uh, uh, the existence of uh, homophobia, not uh, only uh, among ordinary people, but also in a culture, and not only today, but also a uh, long, long time ago, and even beyond uh, history that uh, we, we, we have registered. And many of intellectuals in Iran, or, or many of Iranian people, they really want to deny that, that, that we don't have that. But I believe that as long as the homosexuality exists, it's always existed, uh, homophobia existed. That was what I wanted to explain through my uh, childhood memory uh, and um, the fact that uh, I always felt it through my life all the way uh, until the, uh, the time that I came out of closet. And uh, not completely, of course, because I don't think anybody is able, when you have been in uh, some secretive life for a long, long time, you're able to totally get rid of it, it become part of your psychic and your behavior. And it's not because of us, it's because of the whole uh, community, the whole society. Uh, we shouldn't blame uh, victims. I think it's, uh, it's what we get. The fact that we conform to straight society is mostly because we feel that that's the only way to survive. And of course, for my case, I, I, was, I felt I was creative. I could use my imaginary friends and other um, you know, way of survival, but every single gay person, every single queer in this world, they have a way to survive. And I'm very happy and I love you all guys uh, because, uh, and, and uh, all of you, because you have been able to survive and you are alive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, 
So I'm just gonna um, say a little bit about, this is a the 30, about 30 minute video. We're gonna see a segment that Mokhtar has selected for you. Immediately after this program, you can watch the whole thing. It's beautiful because he incorporates uh, childhood memories and his own st storytelling style and accompanied by the artwork that he's produced. Um, We'll, we'll have a few minutes at the end. So if people want to ask a specific question of Mokhtar, you should make sure that you direct it to him in your chats when the chat is open, okay? Um, Mokhtar, what's the title of your piece? You wanna just say what you... Oh, this one. <laughs> this one actually first, it was the Vname. Means, you know, we have, uh, you know, Name in, in my country means book or means, you know, story. So deep now means the story of deeps, but here is a narrative of the deep tale. And it, and also, or how I survived my closet. So that's the title. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Sounds good. So we are going to be sharing the video and uh, I'm going to be sharing my screen with everyone. So bear in with me for a moment and we are all ready. Let's begin. How can a seven year old will prefer a thief over Rustam? That's a long story. But before I explain how and why Let's see what is Dev or who is Dev. Actually, Deva or Daeva or Dev simply, they all have the same root uh, in Iranian or Indian and means heavenly. Well, the story is in mythology, we can debate about that, that three, 4,000 years ago, Indian and the Iranian they worshipped and shared the same gods. And those gods, they were devas or devs. And when, with uh, Zoroastrian coming to Iran, or, you know, after we had the new religion, most of these devs gradually were wiped out. So, how can human being wipe out a powerful gods? Well, the answer is with the more powerful god. Wipe them out. Because, as they said, the world needed order and the situation with so many gods creates chaos. So, for, to create order, we need one powerful God. And that one powerful God was Ahura Mazda. Well, actually there were two gods, Ahura Mazda and Ahriman. And these two were fighting with each other. And of course, this always happy ending because usually Ahura Mazda is supposed to win. But who is Ahriman? Ahriman was very much like a bag that you could put all the badass creatures in it, including those thieves who used to be God, including, for example, Paridive Jahi, who used to be the most beautiful, seductive, you can say slutty goddess, or Varun who was also very seductive, homosexual, as they said. I'm very interested in Warun, not just because of he was homosexual, but also because in my country, in my language, Warun also means upside down. And believe me, I have felt I've been upside down or I've been outsider, I've been different, I've been the opposite most of my life. So, many people don't know even what is Warun or who was Warun. Warun is a god of ocean and the sea in India right now, 
But when it comes to my country, Warun means something that's upside down. And if you said that, if you did this one, oh my God, this is so strange. Your work is like a work of Warun, means you do upside down. But Warun is forgotten very much like uh, the way they try to uh, silence something. They usually generalize it, generalize it, they usually simplify it, and they usually use the very common general term for that. They don't say Warun or Paridiv Jahi or anything, they just say Div, Div, Div. This is Div. So in Zoroastrian, in their book, uh, Vandida, uh, for example, directly in, a, for example, in chapter 31, page 132, when they want to talk about homosexual, they said, anybody who is homosexual is a thief. Or in Bondahesh, in a chapter 12, page 185, when they want to talk about the act of homosexuality, they said that is bad act or demon act. Beside those books, uh, in culture, divane, in my language, in Farsi language, divane, which, is refer which refers to div, means the person who is men mentally you know, uh, problematic or, or crazy. So all the bad characteristic goes to divs. And they are very ugly, actually, pictured in those illustration books. They have horns, they have tails, they have spotted body. But believe me, because I really like them, I found those things are very beautiful. And I started to paint them. I started to draw them. And I just, without even knowing, who they are, what they are at the time, I just found them more interesting because I related to them. The denial of homosexuals in many cultures, um, it's not deniable. I'm talking about my own culture, and it's not only about the politicians who say, oh, there is no gay man in Iran, or about ordinary people, even intellectuals. People like Cyrus uh, Shamisa in his book, um, Shahid and Shahid Bazi in Iran, which is about homosexual culture in Iranian literature, he totally ignores and denies the existence of any homosexual before Islam, or at least any homosexual culture before Islam. And he spent a lot of pages talking about Greek homosexuality and later on Turks homosexuality. Uh, but not Iranian. He actually believes that the homosexual culture in Iran came from Turks culture. So, so you can see that. It's, uh, it's not only in one person. It, is, it goes through history. It goes through the whole uh, under skin of all cultures. And uh, homophobia is as long as the uh, homosexuality uh, existed. Thank you. Thank you, Mokhtar. It's a wonderful video, and um, I hope you all get a chance to view the whole thing. Um, it, what is so marvelous is to see his artwork and to see this uh, narrative about Deves and his work, I think, um, is something that is really magical. And um, next week, when we have our virtual dance performance, you will see the appearance in the Deves in another person's um, artistic creations. So um, I think that we're, we're not just celebrating LGBTQIA, we're also celebrating Deves. Um, so thank you, Mokhtar. Um, so we're going to open it up for discussion. And um, I think the chat box will be open soon. So if you have a specific question, I'm going to sort of open the questioning with a couple things that I thought we might might bring us together in a discussion, but we want to make it available for each of you to, um, if we have time anyway, for you to pose questions to either the panel collectively or specifically. So I just want to um, 
open by asking each of you to talk a little bit about how your work as either a writer or artist has given you a voice to express and affirm your queer or gay identity. And what are some of the most challenging aspects of, of doing this in your work, either in terms of getting it published, having a public readership, um, or overcoming fear of judgment from your family or, or peers? And I'll start by asking Nina. Oh, hi. So that was multi multiple questions you asked. OK. Uh, Do you need me to repeat it? No. Okay. I'm going to answer to whatever uh, is in my mind. Good. So I think I, like, I started working on this short story, and it all started because I had this puzzle in my mind and I don't know how to solve it. And like, there's this whole thing in my mind, like I haven't visited Iran for 14 years. That's, I just, I just think of going to Iran, visiting my family and all of that good stuff. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen. However, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think it could happen and I don't know. I don't know what should I do. And at that time I was reading all these interviews with all these uh, O. Henry Prize winners, all these short story authors. And some of them were talking that they start on a sh story because they had a problem. So for them, writing was therapeutic. And I was like, I would like to explore that path. And then I started writing and then I was like, do I care other people to read what I write? Initially, the answer was, I don't care. I have this huge problem in my mind that I, I'm losing a sleepover and I don't know what to do about it. So I started writing it. And then after a while, I realized, oh, this is fun. Like, this is not bad. Uh, this is, yeah, this is fun. And that's how, so occasionally you just, because Persis is a professor at SF State at where I go to school. So I saw Persis on campus and just very casually was like, hey, do you have time? I want to read you my story, which tells you about the amazing personality of Persis, which is so welcoming. And Persis was cool. So we went to her office and I read it for 10 minutes. And so it has been fun, but it hasn't been published. Sometimes I think about having it published, but then I start working on this story and I'm like, I don't know what this, yeah, it's very difficult. So, but it's fun. Good. Well, that's the question I answered first. I don't know. That's good. Yes, thank you. Um, Danny, would you like to take a stab at this? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, one, one thing that's come up with this piece, um, a question, that that um, was asked of me of a journalist and the people who have read it is what my parents think of it. And I, well, as my, because the email is a private correspondence, I didn't even think about my parents as I was writing it. And then when it, it they asked me if I wanted to publish it, I didn't, I also didn't um, care at all. So the, the I don't feel a particular, um, anxiety about the about Iran or Iranians accepting or rejecting me and I say that because I think I found that courage through Persian literature. Persian literature is, is a, are these foundational texts that create Persianate culture are so as as Mokhlar was saying beautifully they're so essential to to the how Iranians see themselves, so the, the work of, of Ferdowsi or Hafez or Saadi or Molana. And it was really through them and studying them that I realized how queerness exists because identity is, is, is normative, right? It's, I, I am, this is me, that is you. And Iranianness, it, it, it questions those boundaries a lot because. In someone like Molana, you get a, the, the mass navi, which starts as a complaint. So he's already kind of feeling marginalized. And then in books five and six of the mass navi, you get 
what could only be considered pornography. And some of it is homosexual pornography. I mean, some of it is pedophilia. And I don't think, I, I don't mean to say that Molana was gay and whatever his relationship, relationship with Shams was like, I don't know, but, but it's there. And, and so I found through, and I, I, to, I, another wonderful thing about the Persian language is that it lacks gender. And I, and it's, it's a glorious feature. And so I, I remember being sort of thrilled, though I, I've always been um, comfortable with my gender expression and, and my biological gender. My mother still, though she's been in America since 1964, will still answer the phone and say, oh, Danny, she's not home right now. I don't know where she is. She is still confused at the two. It's like the last thing to go. So I love that. And um, I, so I guess I, I know I'm all over the place, but I'm saying that there is something within Iranian culture that we can find as a source of empowerment. And, uh, and I, I, I think it's, it's through that that I was able to, to uh, break past my own struggles and tell my story. And um, yeah, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful to these, these old, <laughs> these dead men and also some of the contemporary writers too, but, but um, there really is so much beauty and so much depth. And uh, it's not by chance that Rumi is a best-selling author. Thank you. Something. Yes, thank you very much. Dena, will you please uh, take a stab at it? Yeah, of course. Um, so one of the main reasons uh, why I write about myself and my identity is because when I was growing up um, and coming into my own queer identity, I honestly thought I was the only Iranian queer person ever. <laughs> And it seems really naive to see that, but like without representation, like we, we are kind of doomed to like forge our own paths. And so that was something to me that like I very much had, um, so I had struggled with. And so to me being in this moment in this space is just fantastic to me. But also, when it comes to writing, I definitely don't want to be defined only by my Iranianness and by my queerness, because I think us as people, like we are so much more than what our differences are, because I do believe that we do have more in common with each other than our governments would like to think. And then especially in terms of how identity is formed, especially I'm thinking of like within the Gen Z um, generation and how like so much of their identity is like curation through online engagement. And they have so much more access to information and language for things that like I didn't have growing up. Like for example, I um, what, grew up with my mom making the same um, pronoun shifts because she wasn't able to kind of get her hands on that concept because the first language I grew up speaking didn't have any gendered pronouns. And so that sense of having access to language that describes what we are has been hugely, like, hu hu it's, it's a huge um, change and in influence in how I've been able to view myself and be able to navigate the world. And with my writing, I do really am trying to create the space that I didn't have growing up as a queer adolescent for the queer adolescents behind us that are coming forward into the next generation. So that, that to me is really how I view it. And one thing that I'm always really fascinated about is that people are like, oh, you're so brave, you're so courageous. And I really truly just view it as being my fullest authentic self, because that is my personal way to happiness. And that is seen as such a radical act. And that's seen as very transgressive, depending on where your viewpoint is coming from. But it's literally what everyone tells you to do is be yourself. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> so that, that to me is something that like, I just try to be authentically most myself in, in my writing and have that carry through to show people that this isn't some scary thing and that we, we, are, we do exist and we are out here. And also like we've been creating culture bef before it was being even written down. And so I, I feel very strongly um, about that and creating the representation that I didn't have and also like illuminating the, 
the lies we tell ourselves about what is and isn't real in terms of like, I think what Danny was saying so eloquently about history and that having that sense of historicism of where our queer ancestors also come from. Thank you, beautiful. Mokhtar, would you like yeah. to um, respond to the multifaceted question about how your work has given you a voice to express and affirm your queer identity and what are some of the challenges that you have faced? Well, uh, before, before we go, I just wanted to thank my uh, uh, fellow queer member of this panel that really, really beautifully just, you know, uh, spoke about this. And um, I just wanted to also add that uh, when I came out to my family, uh, you know, I'm from working class, um, you know, really just secular from uh, south of Iran. And I actually felt uh, very stupid uh, when I came out, why I didn't do earlier. So you see, that's, that's the kind of challenge. From one side, you're scared to come out because you think you're going to lose your loved one. From the other side, uh, when you come out, you see you know, lots of love, lots of support. I think the problem is not individual or single family or you know, some group of people. I think it's a whole uh, culture and, and a problem that hasn't been debated. I uh, just wanted to make one thing very clear uh, that it's not about Iran or Uganda or some other country. Every ha culture, every country has been through a phases. In the United States, for 30, 50 years ago, it wasn't the haven of uh, homosexuals. I mean, we had all these things, uh, you know, uh, everywhere. You know, I, I live in Bay Area and still I face homophobia. Uh, so uh, what I wanted just to say is in Iran, we need something to be talk about, to debate about this. This is uh, what is very important, and especially about the relation between the power uh, of, of uh, you know, patriarch and, and man culture power related to either a women's issue or, or homosexual uh, you know, issue. That's what I just wanted to clear. As for myself, my first novel, uh, Shama Ilmana, has a, a bisexual character in it. And it's an epic novel, it's like almost 800 pages. It was published in Iran. And so I just felt that I needed to express myself. But of course it was when I was 40 years old, when I, when I do that. When I, was, you know, when I was very young, I knew about myself, about, you know, I'm different and I still, I could create something, but I never were able to, uh, to express it. So I, if I had the, some homoerotic pictures or homoerotic poetry or something, I didn't show it to other people. So the problem actually is that when I dare to do that, when I uh, do that, that is, that is the time you express it. Of course, it was saving me, it was helping me individually to go through that in loneliness. But I think the best part is when all of them come together and I can actually, again, I go to my friends who are more courageous than me. I wasn't as strong as courageous as many of my fellow queer members who came out much earlier. And I wish I could. And um, so that's it actually. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we fully embrace you no matter what age you are. So thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you I feel all. very young with this group of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you all so much. I really appreciate your honesty. And I'm going to um, shift to some of the comments and questions that have been pitched to you. Um, this one is from Mandana Shafa. Says, thanks to all the readers. I'm moved beyond measure by your honesty, your gentle hearts, your beautiful verses and images. I think about how many ways we are di diasporic. We talk a lot about moving from one country to another, but in your case, you've been at times distanced from your own families of origin because they've been uh, unaccepting as well as from your culture. Listening to you, it feels as if, it feels a far worse situation to have family members that may not accept you in all your beauty rather than just in a political situation. Your excerpts say so much, but do you have anything else you want to add? So that's kind of an open-ended question. So if there's something you want to say to each other or what is prompted by listening to each other, I'm going to give you a few minutes to each um, comment if you'd like. 
Well, I'll say something I like. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to thank Mandana for her beautiful words and uh, and say that even though my I was estranged from my family for um, a few years right after I came out, I was also uh, so my family could be taken from me or, or or chose to step away from my life, but they could never take the Iranian out of me. That was always here, and that was always that was always who I am, and and that was again. So I, I really I can't emphasize that enough, and I. You know, earlier I spoke about literature, but even the very identity is, is a, I think, a queer one because it's abrasive. And I'm using queer in the old sense of the word, as in, or it's both queering and queered in that it's, to queer is to make something disadvantageous. And so an, an Iranian, uh, uh, if they are Azari or if they're Kurdish or if they're Jewish or if they're Qashqai or Baluchi, they're, they're, they're somehow, they're, they're not, what are we exactly? And what are, if we are people of color, then why is it that I can pass so often as white? And part of it has to do with my first name, but, but when names come, then, then my last name, because of the Nejad suffix immediately stands out. So there is this, I, I just want to call, call it like a miraculous sense of unease about what Iraniness is. And it's there from the beginning of the literature. Ferdowsi is not the Iranian national poet. The Shahnameh is not the national epic. It belongs to Afghanis and Tajikis as much as it does to us. It's an imperial, it's an, uh, a text of empire, not kingship. And I think that, and Molana or Rumi never lived in modern day Iran. So the, we, we're constantly questioning these, we're, we're, our edges of our identity is very blurry. And so, so is the, the, the edges of sexuality. And, and um, anyway, I, I sort of lost what I was saying, but I just think that there is a source of empowerment in, our, um, in who we are as Iranians. And we, can, we, we have to find that and we have to get our voices heard because that's the only way real change can come. Which I love an, a good party and pride is a wonderful way to feel included and to feel affirmed. But more than that, we need to also create work. And, and art is, um, to my opinion, the most effective way to do it. Nina or Dana, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, I really like what Danny said in terms of like, what is Iranianness? Like, especially because like for myself personally, that's almost something that I felt like was denied to me by like my parents. You're like, no, you're a child of America. Like you're not Iranian. And almost as a term of like forced assimilation. But I'm finding that like my Iranianness informs my Americanness. My Americanness informs my Iranianness. There's no pulling them apart because they're blended together into something that's completely different. Because if I go to Iran, they're going to know that I'm not from there by the way I speak, the way I do my makeup, or the way I dress, or the way I cut my hair. Like to the point where like my dad was like, oh, they don't want to see all this. And I just pointed to like my entire face. And I was like, okay. And then the other side of it being like, okay, well, when I walk down the street, I still have like, you know, white Americans asking me where I'm from. And so that in and of itself isn't like, a, I would consider like a white American experience. But in, in that hybridity, there's something new that's created that becomes something special and, and like unique in a way that I wouldn't have formed myself otherwise. I would, I would be a different person on, with, without those two things. And not to the sense of like, those are what define me, but they very much inform my lived experience to the point of how I navigate the world. And wouldn't you say that there's that in, in, in queerness as well, a hybridity? Because we have so many letters now, LGBTQ, and I, I don't know how my experience is very similar to that of an asexual or an intersexual or a demisexual, but yet we're willing to accept them all because we're all kind of at the edges, we're all marginalized. And, and again, that's why I think that there's a, there's a, great, a great deal of queerness to be, and I don't mean this is some grand socializing theory of identity, I don't mean like all Iranians are queer, but I think that the, there's so many strands that run through the culture ethnically, geographically, and liter literarily that we, that we have, or that our parents' generation, because mostly because of Pahlavi brainwashing, 
um, have forgotten. Yes, I completely agree with that, especially in terms of how we flatten our complexity in order to fit into boxes that seem more digestible, especially in terms of like, I think of like for like marketability or for like capitalism, it's a huge way to be able to market to people. But then when you go back into this like kind of myth making of what Mokhtar was saying of like what the div is and it becomes divune, and it's like almost like what are we saying when we say divune? Like I didn't know the context behind that word. Never my mom was like, stop acting this way and having this sense of queerness specifically because it's like you're acting inappropriate to how I feel you should be acting in comparatively to the rest of the standard. Is it? Yeah, please go. Um, well, um, I think uh, speaking of you know being Iranian or being American, you know I'm a, you know Iranian American. Um, you know when you are in your your own country, you are actually looking around because you are inside of a place, and when you get out, you are looking at that place from distance, so you see the whole thing in a frame, and so you have two points of view when you talk about Iran, and then you here so it is pretty much giving and taking from one side you become more international you become more aware about you know what is you know being homosexual uh, what is being human uh, but from the other side i believe this uh, notion that when you say you know when you are um, you we are not actually bilingual uh, you know, I have, you know, I, I know Farsi, you know, um, my, my Farsi every day become more rusty and my English is never as English as, let's say, in a swimming way. It never can be because, you know, I came here very late. So when they say I'm bilingual, I really feel that I'm half lingual. So from one side, you're losing. From the other side, you're gaining. And, uh, and I think um, um, in, in the 21st century, you can see this whole movement that's happening. And first of all, coronavirus proved that how uh, we are connected. And, and then we have the movement of, uh, I cannot breathe Black Lives Matters, that really, uh, I think uh, it shows uh, the nature of, of this uh, society here where we are. And also, believe me, the whole world. Uh, it's not only in the United States, the racism and other problems. But what I'm saying is that the whole world is actually much more sm smaller. So I'm very happy that I could experience this uh, being internationalist. Like, like you know, uh, I'll be honest with you, I love my country, Iran, and I, you know, I love living in the United States. But at the same time, I just feel that like many everybody right now that I see beautiful faces here, uh, we really also feel very much like a human. We are part of the whole global society right now. And uh, when it comes to um, queer uh, movement, I think I can actually feel much, much more connected to this, the, you know, this movement uh, and better than if I was, for example, um, in, in Iran, my country, or I was here 20 years ago. So I think the right time, right place for this discussion, and I hope, uh, um, uh, you know, we can, we can move on. And one thing I wanted to say about Ferdowsi, I think the way I look at Ferdowsi, Ferdowsi is an um, um, Iranian poet mostly because of the way he described Iran, and, and it also put it in front of another uh, arch enemy called Turan. So that's why I, uh, you know, I, I know about Rumi, who was born in uh, Afghanistan. But when it comes to Ferdos, I don't want to debate about this, but I just uh, wanted to say that uh, Ferdos, you talk about Iran. Okay. Well, I'm going to read a couple of the questions because uh, okay. some of the folks in the audience have written some things. Um, so from Chloe Beckman, uh, Chloe writes, what a powerful exchange, Danny. I wondered, uh, I wondered both when I was reading your essay and when I was listening to your reading today, did you continue your conversation with the student below and are you still in touch? I am still in touch with them, yes. Okay. And um, the, the conversation does continue for another 10 pages, so I, I suggest that she get this book and read it. And another person, while we're on the topic of your essay, said that they were surprised that at the end you returned to give the PS and the PPS and give them the very advice you promised not to offer earlier. 
I'm curious as to why you did that. I was intrigued as this was an unexpected ending for me. And maybe you can summarize what that ending is because we didn't hear it. Oh, the ending is just that I, I, I tell the student that um, I don't know of any Farsi tutors in Los Angeles and that I'm not qualified to say whether they can or cannot take antidepressants. Um, and I added it just because I, I don't I have to look at the actual text, but I don't think I ever said I don't, I'm not going to answer those questions. I just, I, I meant, I thought that, she, that this, this she or he wanted more than what I, I, I was giving. It wasn't, um, it, because it, after 10 years of no contact, um, they could have contacted anyone. They, they, they obviously have family and friends who they feel much closer to. But that they chose me meant something more than, than that there was something about me that they wanted to connect with. So I tried to do that connection first and then the PS actually answered the questions that were in it. Okay. So, and again, it wasn't, this wasn't, I was a stylistic choice. I, it's a very desultory winding uh, essay and it's intentionally, that I intended for it to be published that way. Um, there's a question here from Anna Koreshian and she writes, Thank you for being here. This is so validating to me, especially since as a queer identifying cis woman in a hetero relationship, I often almost always feel like a divune. Um, in addition, queerness is uh, a land of secrets and a pain for me because I suspect that my Baba was deeply closeted all his life. My question is for Mohtar, but I'm also going to extend it to Nina because I think it's pertains to you as well. If you don't mind, could you share a little bit about your coming out stories? Was it in Iran? Did you have any community in Iran? And I hope that you write about it, both of you. Sending love to you all, she writes. So I'm going to start with Nina, um, because I know a little bit, but other folks don't. So uh, I have come out multiple times in different scenarios in different continents, cities. Um, I have come out via phone, via email, uh, via WhatsApp. <laughs> and all of these coming out experiences, they are not fun, like absolutely not fun. There is no fun coming out. At least I have not experienced that. I know there are some people who have fun stories, I guess. I, not mine. And each time I have to tell people what my sexual orientation is because somehow they wanted me to get married with a, with a woman. And that was before I transitioned because at that time I was a man. And then when I came out uh, later as trans, it was a whole different coming out. And then every come out phase that I have had, I have lost family. So it's like, uh, what's the word for it? It's like a pine tree. It's like this. So kind of, it makes your coming out kind of easier because there are less people to talk to. <laughs> which is funny, <laughs> but then uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's just an evolving thing just coming out. It's very painful and I hate it. And the worst thing is when my friends, especially my friends who are cis and straight, they ask me like basic questions about trans, non-binary, all of these things which you can easily find the answer with a very basic Google search. They ask me all of that. And then I have to, again, go on my routine about telling them, Hey, you need to pay me a hundred dollar per <laughs> hour for me to tutor you in these things because it's ridiculous. And then they get offended. The funny thing is that every coming out experience has had all of these things. You come out, you feel vulnerable, I feel vulnerable, and then they ask a stupid questions. And then I just have to remind myself that I am a descendant of Prophet Muhammad, because I am. And then I'm like, oh, maybe Imam Ali would have 
be more patient. Maybe I should tap in my Imam Ali, my inner Imam Ali. So <laughs> I just do that. So like occasionally I even have to quote Prophet Muhammad for them, uh, for, that famous, uh, for that famous hadith that says, well, it is disputed. It could be Prophet Muhammad, it could be Imam Ali that says, treat others the way that you want to be treated, which I just remember Jesus also has said that. So <laughs> I, I, like, it just depends like who I'm coming to. I had these religious Iranian friends. I had to quote Prophet Muhammad, but then I had all of these fake intellectual friends uh, from art university, from University of Tehran Art School that I had to like remind them of all these French intellectuals who treat homosexuality as like nothing. It's just very annoying process coming out. I hate it. And so I'm just trying to make a habit when I introduce myself to tell people my pronouns because that kind of shuts down a lot of things I have realized. Mm -hmm. But all in all, it has been a very traumatic, awful experience, just all my coming out. And I don't think there is any end in sight. It's never gonna end. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you for your patience. Okay, Mokhtar, how about you? Do you wanna, um, cause the question was pitched more directly to you um, about uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about your, um, your coming out story and was it in Iran? Was it here? Did you have community? Um, and have you written about that? Um, I haven't read about that. <laughs> I have, I wrote about that, but I haven't published it. Uh, I have said to, I have told many people uh, several times, and um, I don't think they will, some people, um, they are very open. All of them depend on, you know, our understanding. But some people uh, don't want to accept it. Uh, and so next time, as soon as I just mentioned something in the street and I said, oh my God, this girl is so beautiful. He takes it so sexually and <laughs> he just thinks that, oh my God, so I think you sh we should find a woman for you. So um, it, it is a long process. When, uh, when I came out uh, in Iran, it was in a gathering in a big party that was, they went very well and uh, at the time. But gradually I found out that this group who accepted it so well, uh, they were not very homogenous about that. Each person had its own way of understanding what I was talking about and I had to deal with each person later separately. Some of them still are, uh, you know, kind of uh, in, in denial about this. Uh, most of them accepted that. Um, I'm extremely happy. Uh, as I said, I just felt I should have even down earlier, but it doesn't mean that I don't know um, what I'm dealing with now. I know that uh, the society is responsible for that. It's very much like when we talk about, uh, you know, the racial question. It's not the person who's under the subject of, you know, um, pressure of racial problem. It's actually the person who's oppressive. You know, so we shouldn't ask uh, the, 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 the victim. Uh, and I think in this situation, uh, uh, you know, I as a, you know, a person who grew up like this, um, any action, any reaction, any um, decision that I had was mostly based on the fear or anxiety uh, that I faced every single day that if I do this, if I say that, if I publish it, if I write about this, what will happen? Who I'm going to lose? So yes, it is actually permanent. It's not, it's not ending. As long as the homophobia exists, we are all coming out. There's a process. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, there's a really thoughtful question here from Ashkan Molayi. Um, do we as queer trans identified members of the Iranian diaspora have a responsibility to remain visible and weigh our desires for going to Iran against providing platforms of representation to those without the privilege to leave Iran? And I would add also, uh, to help represent a more complex Iran also. So did everybody get that question? Yeah. Okay. I didn't get it. Okay, I'll read it again, I'm sorry. Do we as queer trans identified members of the Iranian diaspora have a responsibility to remain visible and weigh our desires for going to Iran against providing platforms of representation to those without the privilege to leave Iran? Do you want to answer, Nina, since the screen is on you? Well, the second, I mean, just just being visible as queers, I think it is our human right to be enjoy life, and I think we need to be visible. Yeah, we need to be visible unless it endangers our life. But the second part of the question, I did not fully understand it. Like, are we, like, is it asked if, privileged Iranian queers who live abroad should travel to Iran or sh like, I don't understand that part. I think what the question is asking is um, weighing the risk of having a visible platform against going to Iran, which is kind of touching a little bit on what I wrote about in my essay. And, and for me, like, of course, I, I encourage people to be visible if that's what's comfortable for them. But I still have, you know, I still have family members who are born and raised in the U.S. who are still in the closet um, to their families. And that's not a choice that I'm going to make for them to help them um, without their consent. And so I wouldn't ever tell someone they need to be visible if it would put themselves in danger. But I do agree with you, Nina, that like as queer people, we do have a right to happiness. And our happiness sometimes tends to be more hard fought for, it doesn't come as easy perhaps to us in certain circumstances. And I also feel like incredibly, um, because I was born in America, because I am a US citizen, because I have the protections and privileges that gives me, I feel um, that it is my duty to do that representation for those who can't. I, I think a lot of um, LGBT refugee Iranians stranded in Turkey due to the travel ban about how they can't plead asylum at the United States border um, because of um, that was upheld by the Supreme Court. And that to me is some, because um, within my family history, I, my parents did plead for asylum at the border. And that is how I was able to be born in this country and to, li to live the life that I am living right now. And I, I, I feel a great sense of duty into those people who are stranded, who aren't able to live authentic lives. But I do also know that there are, queer people in Iran being queer and being visible in their ways because I follow them on Instagram, I follow them on Twitter and they exist, but the, there's a sense of solidarity there that is really, um, really comforting to me in the sense that there is still connection, but I would never encourage someone to come out if it would put their livelihood or lives in danger because that is a decision that's very personal and would not want to make that for anyone in, 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 because it's not my decision to make for them. Together, and I just wanted to see if there's, I think that's it for the questions from the audience. I really wanted to also emphasize that um, the only way this topic of homophobia or transphobia will ever be addressed as if we engage in the conversation in public ways. So I really wanna thank each one of you for being here, being courageous, being honest, telling the truth about whether it's painful or easy or um, affirming, all those things. Um, I, I feel that it's something that has 
been long overdue for us to engage with in this community. Um, and I think you all demonstrate what some of the risks are, both in terms of your individual and personal stories, but also the idea that um, we, we're responsible ultimately to ourselves and we're also responsible to build a inclusive community. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in showing an Iranian diaspora community that has lots of complexity, nuance, diversity. Um, you know, we have religious diversity, we have political diversity, and we also have sexual and gender diversity. And I think it's, it's so important, as you spoke to, Dana, for example, the idea of representation is so important for young people to feel that they belong to. Um, and that for me, uh, the notion of a diaspora is this idea that there are many trees and many plants growing in this garden and we want to make a fos to foster a, an environment for all of it, um, that there is no one narrative and no one singular identity. So I really want to thank you for, for making it possible to sort of think about that and to being public about it, even to the point where you're willing to let us record you in this conversation because i think one of the problems is is that everybody knows it exists everybody knows that this conversation is being had in living rooms and homes and families um but until we begin to sort of engage with it publicly it's hard to fight to fight homophobia when you're not even willing to name it so um i wanted to just personally thank you all for that uh, is there anything else um i thought one one question that I wanted to maybe end with, which is if you could give advice either to a younger person um, who has some connection to Iran or Iranian culture or advice to your younger self, what would it be about either coming out or expressing your identity? I can say something because I had the relatives who asked me about this and he wanted to get out, come out. And I asked him, uh, based on my own life experience, uh, I to educate yourself, believe in yourself, and when you are strong enough, um, come out. So I think depend on the situation when you are, you also have to be smart. You cannot come out in a situation when, when I was growing up, uh, if I wanted to come out, I knew what would happen to me. So, I mean, when I was a teenager. So I think it's very important to have some knowledge, emotional, um, educational, and also become a little independent. As, can, as much as, as we can. Uh, I'm talking about in Iranian situation. Uh, so in that case, if they want to kick you out of the house or they want to disband you or you want to you know, throw you out, uh, you, are, you, you, you can stand, you can argue, you can, you know, you can stand your own foot and, and run your own life. And also become good pattern for them to see, okay, if you are going to be this, it sounds like you are doing fine. So I think um, it's all go really, I mean, when, when there is no law to support them, the individual should do something about that. And very much like coronavirus right now, nobody know what it is. So everybody has its own way of protecting himself or herself or whoever. Uh, in that case, yes, I think um, that's, that's, that's what I would tell them. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Um, I would definitely want to tell my younger self that you're not alone. Um, there are other folks like you out there. And also that um, whatever specific struggles or doubts you may have, that they're unfounded. Um, and when you actually do live your most authentic self, that that's when you'll really begin to live. Nina? Thank you. Oh, I just, I have no advice. I just wanted to say my younger self uh, that I needed to have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, also, I was going to say that, and I keep harping on this, the, the, um, 
the queerness of Iranian culture because it's so interesting to me. And I realized that I was not able to come out as a gay man until I first came out as an Iranian. And I really urge young Iranian Americans and young Iranians, if they're able to, to, to say I am an Iranian and not say they're Persian, but take the name of the country. Because as soon as you say I'm an Iranian, there are noises afoot, there are other sounds playing, there are other ways to becoming something more or less of an obedient minority subject. And the same exact thing happens when you say I'm gay. There are other, other sounds are working in people's heads. They're wondering, what, what, are you gay? And what, are, are you, what sexual position do you play? Are you, are you interested in this or that? All these, all these things start, are, are, are buzzing around in people's skulls. And I know, that, I, I mean, I, 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 it has to exist. I can't speak for um, the trans members of our fa um, panels, but of course, and people will wonder about the genitals. And, and there's so many questions that just that come up. And if you have the strength to say you're an Iranian and be proud of it, then when you say you're gay, it's much less scary. <laughs> and it's, and they, they, they are very intertwined. So that's fine. Well put there. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I think we'll end and I want to thank each and every one of you so much for your contributions today and to really support you in the work that you're doing as writers and artists. Um, each of them, you can Google them. Um, Nina's going to work on publishing their story, um, but the others you can find their work uh, in, and publish material. And um, I want to leave you with also the idea that you'll come back next week on the 25th of June at 5 p.m. We're going to have a live stream dance performance with Hushida uh, Mortezayi and Shirin Rahimi. Please follow um, us on social media and uh, get on our mailing list. And please follow Diaspora Arts Connection. And please think about making a donation to help them endure the coronavirus. And Thank you all so much. It was wonderful to be with you this afternoon and to hear your stories and your wisdom. And with that, we bid you good afternoon. <laughs>